Welcome to POTUS 2016, where we call the presidential horse race and pour cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. And what a difference a week makes. Way back before Monday, Hillary Clinton was on the ropes from pneumonia and from calling some Donald Trump supporters a basket of deplorables. This while he was edging up in the polls and acting more disciplined. Now, after the first debate, she looks confident and his winning demeanor has him blaming the moderator, threatening to target Bill Clinton's old marital infidelities and further insulting a former Miss Universe. It's too soon to know if Hillary gets a lasting lift from the debate, especially with a spin factor and some poll hacking that we'll explain in a moment. After that, we'll parse the debate rhetoric with linguist John McWhorter and columnist Alexis Grinnell. And later in our evidence-based politics segment, Third parties, which may be crucial in this election, are they just spoilers or do they enrich the democracy? Let's begin where the fur and mud are still flying. Yes, time for the horse race. Reliable numbers will be tricking in, trickling in over the next few days, but for now be wary of post-debate polling. The polls conducted directly after a debate rarely draw from accurate representations of the electorate. These polls are usually conducted online, gather a self-selecting group of unverifiable participants, and are easily manipulated at a time when the media's spin can be just as important as the debate itself. In fact, manipulation is exactly what two particular groups of online Trump supporters had in mind this week. According to the internet culture news site, The Daily Dot, Members of the 4chan and Reddit online communities targeted over 70 public online polls, including those conducted by Time, Fortune, and CNBC. With easy-to-use hacking tools like computer bots or even through something as simple as changing a browser's privacy settings, the groups were able to easily circumvent polling safeguards and register an exaggerated support for Trump. Their efforts appear to have worked. The next morning, the Republican candidate championed their trumped-up results to his followers on Twitter and on the stump, and for a brief period had many who watched the debate scratching their heads. This manufactured confusion could have a darker effect yet, reinforcing the idea that the actual outcome in November cannot be trusted. Two polls, however, that weren't contaminated showed that Clinton won the debate, one CNN poll saw her win by a margin of more than two to one. They say that one's probably a little biased toward the Democrats, but it's still a win for her. With another public policy polling poll showing her with a narrower advantage, but still 12 percentage points. And the money was also on Clinton. The British wagering site Betfair saw, saw about a million dollars change hands during the debate and her chances of beating Trump rose from 63 to 69 percent, according to the betters. In addition to Hillary's performance, better may, betters may also be feeling optimistic about her chances because the truth squads are in high gear. During and after the debate, numerous sites heavily fact-checked both candidates' statements. NPR fact-checked 75 statements from both candidates. Politico and PolitiFact each checked about 30 debate claims. Factcheck.org, The New York Times, and The Washington Post each researched about 20 statements. CNN also dug deep, exploring 18 separate topics covered in the debate. All of the outlets showed far more of Trump's statements to be false during the debate than Clinton's. But getting out the vote for Hillary remains a challenge. According to a survey conducted by Gallup before the debate, voters from both major parties indicate that they are less inclined to vote this year, and Democrats, by a margin of 11 percent, were less likely than Republicans to say they would show up at the polls. That number, just 65 percent definitely planning to vote, is well below the Democrats' 77 percent average over the past four elections. 
Stay tuned. Next week, we'll have a better idea of how the debate influenced voters, especially independents. But keep this in mind. According to Nate Silver over at 538, it's the challenging party, not the incumbent one, that usually gains from the first debate. All right, time to deconstruct the rhetoric in that debate a little bit. Joining us, Professor John McWhorter. He teaches linguistics at Columbia University, writes for Time, The Atlantic Magazine, and CNN. His new book is Words on the Move, Why English Won't and Can't Sit Still, like literally. With us as well, columnist and political consultant Alexis Grinnell. Her columns appear regularly in the New York Daily News and can also be found in the Washington Post, El Diario, the New York Post, and elsewhere. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. And I want to go right to a clip from the debate. Uh, the moderator, Lester Holt, quoted Trump saying Hillary did not have a presidential look and lacked stamina. Let's watch her answer. Question. One thing, one thing, Very Lester, quickly, is, you know, he, he tried to switch from, from looks to stamina. But this is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. And someone who has said pregnancy is an inconvenience to employers, who has said, said women don't deserve equal pay unless they do as good a job as Didn't men. Say. And one of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest. He loves beauty contests, supporting them and hanging around them. And he called this woman Miss Piggy. Then he called her Miss Housekeeping because she was Latina. Donald, she has a name. Where did you find her? Her name Where is did Alicia you find this? Machado. Where did you find And it? she has become a U.S. citizen, and you can bet oh, really? she's going to vote okay. this November. Okay, good. All right, and as many of you have seen on TV, Alicia Machado has shown up in the media, has been interviewed a number of times. Alexis, was that a key moment in the debate for you? It's one that's been um, hyped a lot, and it was certainly interesting, but for me it was not nearly as fascinating as the consistent um, dance that Hillary did to succeed, which was, even in delivering those lines, she had a relaxed, smiling expression on her face. She was slow, she was comfortable, and she was delivering daggers. That's very hard to do, and she had to deliver it in just that way in order to be heard even. Every time Hillary uh, engages in either debate or some kind of interview, there's usually a you know very big discussion about what she did wrong. She's too shrill, she's not smiling enough, there's, you know, she's angry. This is sort of, sort of the regular double standard women in public life are subjected to. And uh, it sort of, you know, recalls the adage that Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards in high heels. That's really hard. So to me, it's not so much even the content of the uh, dagger she delivered, but the carriage with which she delivered it. John, you want to pick up on that? Um, I actually found that a very disappointing moment in the debate for a different reason, which is that Lester Holt was often afraid to truly interrupt Donald Trump. And Donald Trump did a lot of interrupting in that debate, which was technically not supposed to be part of the format. And really, he could have been stopped. Holt could have, in a good, strong voice, very often said, Mr. Trump, you have to stop and let her talk. And he didn't do it. And especially at the moment where what he said was about Hillary's appearance. And that's really nasty. And I would have liked to have seen him put in a position where he had to answer about what he had said about what Hillary Clinton looks like. Now, Trump, you know, wisely for him, shifted it to this issue of stamina, which is rich and is worth talking about. But the appearance would have really been the winner. Now, Hillary got it back and brought up Machado, but it would have been better if it was about making that man suffer for having said something about her appearance. Holt, though, didn't interrupt Donald Trump enough to set him back on that track, whereas he could have said, if I had been the moderator, I would have said, Donald Trump, you talked about Hillary Clinton's appearance. Address that, sir. And I wouldn't have let him get away with it. Somehow Holt seemed to think that it wouldn't have been quite polite or gentlemanly to really stop that train in its tracks. Mm. And it really disappointed me because I think that that moment, which ended up being about Machado, and that was good, but I'm sure she would have brought that up later, could have been about him saying such a horrible, superficial thing about the person right next to him. Holt let him slide. I know you wanted to say something about post-debate 
punditry sure. sexism. Sure, I, I do, and I want to quickly agree with John that I think uh, if we're grading the moderator, that would have absolutely been appropriate, but it actually ended up working to Hillary's advantage allowing Trump to break all the rules, to interrupt her, I think I saw a stat of 70 times, mm -hmm. and badger her, and really, I thought looked like a, you know, hyperventilating man baby having a total meltdown, uh, only served to underscore her professionalism, her calm, her adulthood, and really from a gender perspective, the image of a man interrupting, harassing, and just <laughs> taking up all the ox oxygen is one I think a lot of women watching could relate to and immediately feel affinity to Clinton. So, you know, as somebody who is not supporting Donald Trump, I was happy to see that uh, Lester let him eat the mic there. I get that completely, yeah. although there's very briefly, there was another part of me that thought I often wanted to hear more of what she had to say. Mm. And I thought that perhaps Trump being told to stop talking so often would have had a lot of the same effect that you're talking about, but I completely get your point. Yeah, well, I would have loved somebody to tell Trump to stop talking a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> and so that's a larger criticism, I think, of the way in which the media has moderated this debate writ large. But to your right. point, the post-debate spin, where we see pundits kind of coming in to shape and frame the narrative, is also fascinating, because that's where we have this whole discussion. And to me, it really, I'm amazed to see so many, it's generally white men, uh, discussing Hillary's like ability, her charm, um, whether or not she connects on a human level. And th these are inherently subjective categories, frankly, but they're deeply gendered. And if we're looking, you know, I think at the way women respond to this debate versus white male pundits, I think there's a huge divide. And we saw it even in the Lazio-Clinton debates of yore, oh, where yeah. everyone at That's the- That's 2000 Senate run against right. Republican Congressman he, Rick Lazio he from New York. Her, right? he, he came over and really kind of used her, occupied her space, badgered her. Right. Men at that debate in the, in, in the aftermath thought that Lazio had won, huh. and women thought that Interesting. Clinton All had All right, won. so we saw Hillary Clinton at work. Let's see a little Donald Trump at work on the question of law and order. No, the argument is that we have to take the guns away from these people that have them and that are bad people that shouldn't have them. These are felons. These are people that are bad people that shouldn't be. When you have 3,000 shootings in Chicago from January 1st, when you have 4,000 people killed in Chicago by guns from the beginning of the presidency of Barack Obama, his hometown, you have to have stop and frisk. You need more police. So, John, you're laughing. Well, you could tell me why you're laughing. <laughs> well, for one thing, his statistics were all over the place. But I mean, that moment was interesting to me in that, you know something, Brian, I am going to say, he's talking about the bad people. I wouldn't talk about the people in question being bad. You grow up in a society. But what he's talking about is, and I'm going to say the taboo word, Black on black crime. I refuse to submit to this fatwa against that term. All I mean by it is black on black in contrast to the white on black crime that gets too many, especially black men killed. In contrast, there is not white, but black on black crime, and it's a problem in black neighborhoods. Now, I wouldn't say that the people are bad people. However, that's what Trump thinks, and therefore, the idea that a couple of beats after that, he jumped on Hillary for using the word super predator back in the early 90s is absurd because he most certainly has exactly the kinds of feelings about these quote unquote bad people that would create a word like super predator, whereas I doubt if he quite understands this, but when Hillary said it, she was talking about it in sympathy with black communities, and I think that reading that word as racially coded has been a kind of a witch hunt against her, which I have disapproved of. But it was an interesting moment because, frankly, bad people, what a horrible thing to say about people who in many cases are caught up in circumstances that they can't control. But for him to then, after that, clearly having been coached to do it, bring up the super predator comment as if he ever disapproved of it, was extremely disingenuous. And the sad thing is that was the closest thing to clever debating that I think he pulled the whole night. And the NYPD, New York City Police Department, has fact-checked his stop and frisk example of New York for the nation, so there was also that. Mm -hmm. um, but if that was one of the few good moments that he had in the debate all mm -hmm. night, which seems to be the consensus uh, among most media people Clever, and least, yeah. most high school debate coaches. <laughs> um, why do you think 
that is. Do you think, as a linguist, do you think that there's a difference between the way the same Donald Trump language or presentation style goes over in a televised debate like that compared with uh, the live rally events, which seem to have been effective for many people? Yeah, and I don't think it's an accident that that great moment came in the discussion of a topic, race, which really gets us in our viscera. Suddenly, the sort of one-liner Donald worked a little bit in a way that it hadn't before. What he's used to doing is whipping up the troops by using language in its most unvarnished form, which is small packets of words at a time coming from the subjective and designed to hit us at the bottom of our brains. He does that very well. He's one of those people where I have watched him give speeches and had to remind myself that I didn't agree with anything that he was saying. It's hard to resist it. It's like a simple nursery rhyme. But when it comes to standing beside someone who's doing the simple thing of making points, making extended arguments, suddenly it shows that there are different ways of using language and he couldn't help but look bad. Well, also, I thought Hillary very effectively used his language against him in, a, in subtle, strategic ways. So whereas he would say things, you know, he'd make this offhanded comment like, well, I know, mm -hmm. Secretary Clinton, you've had to stay home the last few days. <laughs> she understood the gendered implication of that accusation, which is, again, no stamina, not presidential. She shot back at him to say, you know, I think you're saying to me that you're criticizing me for preparing for this debate. Well, you know what else? I prepared to be president. And it was an amazing moment where she used his language against him and all the implications of it and took a stand essentially to say, I'm not going to apologize for being smart and prepared and being better than you and while female. Best line of the night. Yeah. And stay there, you two, as we bring on some additional evidence. Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold, hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. One lesser-known presidential hopeful made a last-minute effort to broadcast her rhetoric Monday night, but police escorted Green Party candidate Jill Stein off the Hofstra University campus when she attempted to hold a press conference. Neither Stein nor a Libertarian Party candidate Gary Johnson has reached the 15 percent mark required by the Commission on Presidential Debates to appear on the main debate stage. Those running outside the major parties rarely do. An exception was 1992 when another wealthy businessman running for office, Ross Perot, famously warned George Bush and Bill Clinton against NAFTA, the very trade agreement Donald Trump rails against today. To those of you in the audience who are business people, pretty simple. If you're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, hire a young 25, let's assume you've been in business for a long time, you've got a mature workforce. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor, have no health care, that's the most expensive single element, making a car, have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money, there will be a giant sucking sound going south. Third party candidates like Perot can be viewed either as harming or enriching the democracy. Our guest scholar sees benefits in a strong two-party system. Howard Gold is professor of government at Smith College and co-author of Parties, Polarization, and Democracy in the United States. He joins us via Skype from Northampton, Massachusetts. Professor, welcome. Hi, Brian. How are you? Good, thanks. Is our two-party system in the Constitution or anything, or did it just develop that way? Uh, in fact, the Constitution says nothing about parties. Uh, the founders, were, Madison in particular, were very worried about parties. They, as you know, they were worried about factions and the destructive uh, effects of, of small factions pursuing self-interest. So no, the, the uh, Republic evolved that way. There was nothing uh, constitutional or, by, or uh, about the two-party system. It was, not, it was never part of the design. Why here? There are so many other democracies that we hear about in Europe and elsewhere where multi-party systems do develop and there are different factions, if you want to use that word, or different uh, groups of the population who are represented significantly in parliaments and such. 
There are so many reasons I actually don't know where to begin. Uh, well, let's start with some of the institutional designs. Uh, the first past the post electoral system does nothing to help third parties. Now, it's true that Britain or Canada or Australia, well, Britain and Canada in particular, have first past the post systems and third parties have managed to emerge. Um, the electoral college is yet another uh, problem. Uh, parties or candidates that win concentrated support actually gain something in the electoral college. Think of George Wallace in 1968. He concentrated his vote in, primarily in five southern states and actually captured some electoral votes. Uh, a candidate like, like Ross Perot, who you just who you just uh, whose excerpt you just aired, Perot won almost 20 million votes nationwide, the second most successful third party candidate in American history, and won a grand total of zero states because that support was diffuse. And so, uh, so there, there are, are some issues. structural Money, reasons. Media, there's so many issues. And why do you argue, and I, I understand that you do, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that the two-party system, more or less as we have it, is better for the democracy, uh, for the institution of democracy, better represents the people than if we were more factionalized? Well, that's part of the argument, but I have to say that's not the whole argument. The argument really is, in the book, we try and de de uh, describe in what sense the American parties have become more polarized. And the argument that we make in the book is that there's, although polarization certainly can lead to gridlock and paralysis and some of the stuff we've seen in recent years, there are some hidden or lesser, lesser vaunted benefits to polarization. So if you have a two-party system where parties are clearly defined, where they're disciplined, where they, where they um, are, are um, unified, uh, essentially that offers voters much more choice and more accountability. You know, you think about the Democrats of the 1960s, say before the era of polarization. The Democrats were the party promoting civil rights and voting rights. They were also the party uh, opposed to civil rights and voting rights. They were very factionalized. So one of the arguments we, wake, we, we make is that voters, have a, voters know what they're getting when, when, when you've got unified, disciplined parties that are widely separated along the so-called ideological spectrum. Voters know what they're getting when they vote for a Democrat or they vote for a Republican. Why is it, do you think, that the third parties that are developing now in this country uh, to some degree are not between these two polarized parties, the Democrats and the Republicans? You have the Green Party candidate, Jill Stein, who's you know, to the left of Bernie Sanders, and you have the Libertarian Party, which uh, wants to abolish Social Security, abolish the minimum wage, and abolish the income tax, meaning they're even to the right of pretty much the most conservative Republican in Congress. That's actually a very good question. And in fact, uh, if you look at the history of third party success at the presidential level and even at the gubernatorial level, the re the, the, really the best recipe is sort of coming up the middle, this blend of fiscal moderation or fiscal conservatism and social liberalism. Uh, you look at Ross Perot, I mean, he, wasn't, he didn't really emphasize social issues all that much. But he was perceived as being a social moderate along with a fiscal conservative. Um, then you look at some of these governors like Angus King of Maine, currently in the Senate, Lowell Weicker of Connecticut, that's exactly, Jesse Ventura of Minnesota, that's exactly what they did. And so electorally speaking, it's probably not a smart move to go on the outside. On the other hand, if the parties are not, if the parties are somehow, if the Democrats are a center left of center party and the Republicans were or are a center right of center party, there, there hasn't traditionally been all that much room in the middle. Yeah. So parties have moved to the extremes. Though for a while we heard speculation that there could be what they used to call the McCain-Lieberman party, right? The kind of centrist Republican John McCain in his most centrist days and the centrist Democrat Joe Lieberman. Uh, or today it might be called the Mike Bloomberg party. That's but right. nobody thinks that that candidacy could get off the ground. Well, the two-party system is so deeply entrenched that it, the obstacles that it's um, erected are simply enormous. Money, media access, debates, and above all, getting on the ballot. These obstacles are so formidable for third parties that even someone like Bloomberg, with the money he has, doesn't want to waste that much money on an effort that's likely to be a yeah. uh, failure. John, Alexis, you have a question for our guest? Um, yeah, I do. I... I think I have the same nostalgia that everybody does for that government that worked that you read about in Robert Caro's books about LBJ and that is beautifully depicted as happening now on House of Cards. But it seems that really 
it's impossible to have it because of the nature of social media and the fact that everybody can talk at one another all the time. I don't see how we get out of the polarization, and that's not to say that I find it exhilarating. I'm not that much of a pessimist, but it seems that we're stuck with exactly the way that it is now. So how does that impact upon your vision of what's good about the two-party system, that it's always going to have to be within all of the fury and incoherence and polarization that we have now? Well, I mean, it's, interesting. it's an interesting question. You need to kind of figure what are the roots of this polarization. I mean, some of it is institutional and can be adjusted. Redistricting, for example, is an important cause of polarization. Um, but there have been, if you go back, you know, if you think about why, why have the parties become so ideologically divided and so obstinate about their views and unwilling to compromise? I mean, you think about, um, think about Reagan and the growth of social issues and the religious right moving into the Republican Party. Think about the nationalization of Roe v. Wade being subsumed by the Republican Party. Uh, think about the growth of the religious right. Think about the, the Robert Bork hearings of the 80s and the Gingrich era in the 90s, the impeachment of Clinton. There's so much history now that is uh, very hard for the parties to shake. Mm -hmm. So I, honestly, yeah. I don't know how we get out of it. Uh, but I do think, as I said, though it is one of the causes of gridlock, at least voters know what they're getting. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for that. Alexis, any third party thoughts or a question? Seems to be a real threat to Hillary Clinton right now, especially with millennials uh, polling so strongly for right. either the Libertarian or the Green. Well, actually, I, uh, Hillary Clinton aside, I was just thinking about uh, multi-party systems in uh, parliamentary democracies, which the political development literature actually points to as more fundamentally stable. In emerging democracies, you want a multi-party parliamentary system because presidential systems are too easily uh, subject to coup or to um, stagnation, whereas the volatility of parliamentary systems means that nobody can sort of take command, take control, take hostage a government. and. Um, I was just curious to know if you'd look comparatively at the development and advancing of um, issues in emerging democracies and the sort of long-term stability compared to presidential systems. To be honest, in our work, we actually do some comparative work, but it's not developing nations versus uh, the U.S. And it's really looking at Anglo-America sure. and trying to understand the, the extent of polarization in Australia, Canada, and Britain alongside the United States. But your point is right. Uh, there certainly is a, lot, a high degree of stability in parliamentary systems. Interestingly, all of those countries have multi-party systems, right. and a lot of it has to do with regional representation. What you don't find in the United States are sectional parties, sectional third parties mm. that are successful. I mean, the Democrats used to be the party of the South. The Republicans are, not, are, no, are now the party of the South. But one could imagine a different political world in which you have the Democrats and the Republicans and, say, a sectional party representing Southern interests. You've got that in Canada, you've got that in Britain, and you've got that in Australia. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you all three for a great conversation. Thank you for joining us today. And that's POTUS 2016 for today. Next Tuesday, the vice presidential debate, debate involving a concise four syllables, John. Mike Pence, Tim Kaine. Thanks for watching. I'm Brian Lehrer.